morning. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for Payments Canada for having me as one of the keynote speakers for the day. And secondly, and most importantly, thank you one and all for having made it for the session. Now, over the last uh, two days, I've been, I did have the opportunity to, to participate in a number of, uh, listen through a number of panel discussions and some of the keynote speeches. And some of the, uh, there was, uh, there, there were the certain hallmarks which really came out of the conversations. Open banking, digital identity, then you had uh, the artificial intelligence, distributed ledger, virtual currencies, fiat currencies, and so forth. Now, over the next 14 minutes, what I'll do is I'll speak to you about uh, the future of payments. Now, assuming the fact that all of the the molecules that we spoke about over the last few days, that is open banking, artificial intelligence, real-time payments, domestic, cross-border real-time payments, what if they all metamorphosized into uh, a similar level of maturity? And if you, if you were to amalgamate all of these value molecules into a complex polymer. So how does the future of payments really look like if you were to put all of them together. Because basically what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to connect all of the dots that we listened through over the last uh, two days. My inference, and again, even before you go into the future of uh, payments, it might be worthwhile for us to fast forward for the time being 12 hours ahead of time. That is, get straight into what's happening into Malaysia, understand from them what is the state of affairs as well as the, the modernization program that they're currently uh, embarked on, and what are the interesting set of use cases that they have been contemplating. So the program was announced in uh, April 2017. It's currently in motion as we speak. The go live is August 2018. This is for the payment network in uh, Malaysia. The tenets of modernization are exactly the same as that of Payments Canada, but with two fundamental differences. One of the use cases that they have is that you can link your bank account to a proxy ID, and that's no-brainer, right? That's no-brainer. Most of the real-time econ economies have really done that. But what they're saying is you can use your proxy ID to execute cross-border purchases. So which means that, let us say, if you travel down to Singapore, and what would happen is uh, on, the, on the tap of the, uh, the mobile phone, onto the point of sale reader without having to disclose any of your sensitive personal information or the card information, you can essentially execute a cross-border general purchase transaction. That's point number one. The second point that they were speaking about is the connectivity of all the real-time, domestic real-time payments, which simply means that they did have the, the, the NRPS in Philippines, the NAPAS in Vietnam, ITMX in Thailand. So, what we're saying is the, the domestic real-time payments that we are speaking about today, the next advent of the real-time payments is going to be global cross-border real-time. This simply means to say that no matter wherever you are, you will be able to execute transaction at a much lower cost, at a much faster pace, just, though, just as though you were texting uh, from your mobile phones to your friends and families. Now, the, the key message out here is, uh, secondly, you also have this, uh, I also heard another term which was the digital ecosystems, or somebody used the term business ecosystems. And to me, the Alipays of the world and the Tencents of the world really came into existence. So what that really meant was that you, they, they, they follow the customer wherever they go. Alipay currently does business in around 20 countries. They, uh, they do uh, accept transactions. They enable you to make purchases and transactions in over 20 different currencies. They're truly cross-border. The great effect here is that they have used this concept of open APIs and using the technology as the fabric, they have essentially connected all of the partners into one single mobile app. That's, that's a single reason as to what makes them the number one mobile payments uh, systems in the world. So they go wherever the Chinese consumers go. 
So it, it's, it's just a mashup. And the reason why I said all this open banking, digital ID, the, uh, the artificial intelligence are value molecules, because if you take all of these molecules, no molecule can stay alone by itself, right? So if you take all of these value molecules, and if you amalgamate into a complex polymerized chain reaction, that's exactly where you lend yourself into a hyper-connected, collaborative, cross-border, the borderless commerce. And that's the true state of where you will be over the next uh, five to seven years. So with that as the basic background, I took the liberty of, uh, of essentially charting out the agenda for Payments Canada uh, in uh, to, uh, 2025. So again, I fully know that this is absolutely aggressive, but there is no reason why Payments Canada should not really aspire for. So what we're saying is you have, it's a completely cashless society, digital fiat currencies, which is, which again, the testimony to that is the experiments which Payments Canada has currently done. So digital fiat currencies have gone mainstream. Distributed ledgers are either in the mainstream or they have gone legacy. Then you're talking about innovations in cashless. And last but not the least is you have all these pockets of ecosystems. Again, if you think of uh, building out an ecosystem with all the partners, that is, if you take a bank, connect all of the APIs from different industry sector, use the technology as a fabric, and that becomes a local ecosystem, which means that you go wherever the consumer goes. But if you take a moment and then you think about expanding this ecosystem cross-border, so this local ecosystem essentially spans itself into a cross-border real time, right? So the culmination of all of this could be the agenda for the future of payments uh, that Payments Canada will be speaking in uh, 2025. Now, again, in order to understand how the world will look like over the next uh, five to seven years, it might be worthwhile to understand some of the key transformational initiatives that some of the central banks have uh, done, and that includes the Bank of Canada as well. So you got, uh, you got the digitization, the virtual currencies. Again, whether we like it or not, the underlying technology is here to stay, right? And whether we like the currencies and the underlying security and the regulations, we like it or not, these uh, virtual currencies, what we, have, what we have been seeing is that they enjoy a growing market capitalization. So when you take April 2017 as the benchmark, the market capitalization was close to $30, $30 billion, which means it had exceeded the valuation of Airbnb, right? So the second aspect of it is the digital, the digital fiat currencies, which uh, some of the central banks have been doing. Notably, the Mizuho Bank, which is, uh, which is thinking of launching the J-Coin, when that's scheduled to go live by the 2020 Olympics in uh, Tokyo. Then you have the e-Krona, which uh, the Swedish Central Bank is, uh, is working upon, positive results. Again, the same testimony is that uh, you have the Jasper as well. Now, that leads us to a question. Would, you, uh, would faster payments rail? be a separate rail to the fiat currency rail? The answer is yes, it would be. There may be certain people who might argue that they may be one or uh, they, they could potentially be the same, but my testimony is that they will be two different rails because not all countries will become cashless all at the same point of time. Now with this as the, as the key elements, what is it that banks will need to do? Banks will, again, if you see the payments experience, payments is at the, at the bottom. The lifestyle experience really stays on top of the customer. So basically providing the novel business moments is prime on top of the customer's mind, right? So banks will essentially fo focus on forging partnerships, not just with the digital partners, but anybody who can contribute value to the customer in the transaction life cycle. And the main focus will be to provide immersive customer experiences through providing value-added services and data and insights. Now, how do they do this? If you can imagine that you have a six-cylinder engine, you, one cylinder is primarily the commodity services, the second cylinder will be a secret sauce which you identify within the bank and which you can monetize it. 
Then you have the secret sauce, which you can also subscribe from the external community. So both an inside-in as well as an uh, outside-in uh, perspective. And then you have the co-innovation with all of your partners. And last but not the least, is creating the marketplaces. There is one large bank in the UK which is currently on, on course in terms of stripping out their technology platforms and creating and isolating the commodity services and focusing on creating the online marketplaces and the digital ecosystems. So essentially, banks will become more like an API factory. The primary focus will be churn out APIs, and which, which essentially add value to the customer interactions. Now, they're not alone. Essentially, the regulators will play a very, very critical role. So you will have the traditional rails coexisting. You will have the alternate currency rails also coexisting. You'll have a strong risk management competency, which means that central banks, rather, the national payment system operators will essentially take the lead responsibility to provide for a strong fraud and cyber surveillance uh, platforms. And possibly they are in the best position to do that because they will be able to subscribe, they publish out the information and also subscribe for the for uh, the risk intelligence from external jurisdictions. Now, again, we speak about the ecosystems here. We there are multitude of ecosystems, and again, banks will not prepare. They will not be ready for one ecosystem. They will monetize the data. They will participate in distributed ledger technology. They will participate in uh, the uh, the risk ecosystems. They'll uh, create their own customer engagement ecosystems. So essentially, from a central bank perspective, they will stay in the center of the universe. So the national payment systems operators will essentially have oversight and governance across multitude of ecosystems which will all hang around. Uh, they will all coexist at the same point of time. So, so, uh, so if you imagine Payments Canada, which is the, the, uh, the national payment systems operator in the center, and connecting to that are a set of satellites or the, or the planets where you will see the IOTs, you will see the risk, the cyber surveillance uh, ecosystem, you will see the closed loop DLTs, the open loops DLTs, then you have the data uh, ecosystems, and the primary reason for that will be uh, that uh, they will exercise governance, strong controls to ensure that uh, they are fully compliant. At the same point of time, they hyper out artificial intelligence. Necessarily, what would happen is that the, uh, with both within the bank as well as with the regulatory community, you will have supervisors, the robotic supervisors, which will essentially take responsibility to watch over the adherence to compliance. So both these bodies, that is both the banks as well as the, uh, the national payment systems operators will, will uh, from, from the viewpoint of adoption of artificial intelligence, they will have, they will exercise more, they will develop more supervisory uh, robots that will ensure that all the all the uh, the virtual workforce essentially uh, are fully compliant with the operational laws now coming back to the final uh, element here now if you take all of this atomic molecules that is uh, the open banking open banking is meaningless without a real time payments infrastructure so if you take open banking if you take digital identity, and if you think about the digital identity held centrally and which can be made interoperable across the jurisdiction, that creates a powerful combination. Similarly, if we were to think, again, these are, these, these are, there are strong evidences out here. The, if you think about the domestic payment, the real-time ecosystems, essentially connecting across to other national real-time payments ecosystem, it simply means to say that we will be able to send transactions at a much faster pace, at a lower cost, and uh, at the convenience of the customer, irrespective of any uh, constraints on the clearing calendars or any, uh, so it essentially becomes a hyper-connected, collaborative, digital, bo borderless commerce. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the proof point out here. Uh, so again, uh, the, the, there are strong, uh, uh, testaments to this. So you have the Nordics Payments Association. There's already work which has been done by the International Payments Framework Association, so essentially, and also the SWIFT GPI. So if you mash up all of them together, essentially it becomes 
a boundaryless information, payments information highway where banks will stay very, very close to the customer wherever they are and uh, stay very, very relevant uh, through this product manufacturing approach.